Uh, before we start, I think it would be uh, reasonable to just give everybody a two sentence, only two sentences, short introduction of themselves. So I'll start with you and Niels. Okay, I'm uh, Niels Lauwers, I'm with Plantum, an association of 350 members in the Netherlands, companies that breed or produce seed and that supply a lot of food all over the world. Leo Moll, I'm working with Ajo de Hes, a supermarket that's active in 10 countries and I'm responsible for, for product safety, social compliance, animal welfare and sustainability of the products. Hello, I'm Patience Koku. I'm a farmer from Nigeria. Uh, I work with smallholder farmers. We grow seed, uh, corn seed. Um, I'm a member of the Global Farmer Network and I'm on the advisory board of the Cornell Alliance for Science. Good afternoon, I'm Tom Wakeford. I'm from what our friend from the European Commission called a loudmouth NGO. <laughs> um, but I'll be telling you actually uh, the graph of there being no deaths associated with GM from my many years working in India is out by several hundred thousand. I'm Johan van Aronok, head of research at Hendrik Genetics, an international animal breeding company with activities in 26 countries and active in laying ants, swine, turkey, salmon, trout and shrimp. Thank you. Uh, yes, so on, the, on this last panel, what we're going to discuss is how the so-called CRISPR revolution uh, is going to reach the people who need it the most, or maybe everybody, and or of course, should it reach everybody? And because uh, from my point of view, I, I made a documentary on GMOs, and I think I like GMOs, but for, uh, it didn't really live up to its, to its promise. And so I hope we can discuss, will CRISPR do this or not, and how will this do it? Uh, so to start, probably, uh, I want from you to know, to know what do you actually expect from CRISPR? How do, you, how do you see the world in 10 years, maybe? And probably to start with you, Peyton, not only because you're the only woman in the panel, but also because you're from a continent who has probably the most to gain from this technique. Okay, yeah, so I'm outnumbered, <laughs> but uh, we're balancing for better, so <laughs> keeping the balance. Okay, yeah, so I think that um, when I got the invite to come here, I was super excited because I followed gene editing on my own for many years because I have a daughter <coughs> that has sickle cell. And so, I mean, if you're a parent and your, ha your child has any form of um, um, a disease, you're constantly looking for what's new and hoping for the best. So, I mean, so for me, gene editing is probably the only thing that I would consider, considering the risk with um, bone marrow transplants and so on. Now, Africa is, I mean, I was saying to, to Hide earlier on that uh, I think that the conversation is totally different on the other side of the world because, I mean, we have probably, uh, we have millions of people with sickle cell disease. We have people who suffer from malaria every time. On one of the panels said malaria was a, um, a, a, a disease that poor people get. You, you probably had malaria in Africa. I have had malaria several times. And it's a huge challenge for everyone because it's the cost of treatment, the fact that people die from the disease, from mistreatment. And then when you come to the fact that Africa cannot feed itself. So earlier on, I heard someone talk about food waste. I mean, we are talking about food shortage. So a lot of people go to sleep hungry. And so when you think about the possible solutions to uh, the problems that people have in the world, you need to look at it from the world perspective, because the world is a global village now. And when you look at the fact that on this side, you talk about organic farming. We can't talk about organic farming on the other side of the world. So we need to feed people using less resources. And so um, what I see 10 years from now is, God willing, a world where um, CRISPR and all the techniques for gene editing are available and where people who have, like my daughter, who have sickle cell have a chance to live. So I think that we have to look at the world in a holistic view. And um, I was saying to him also that Africa is more inclined to listen to Europe. 
because we were colonized by the British and <laughs> Europe is closer to us. So when Europe takes decisions, it's good for Europe to know that what you do here has a ripple effect on the rest of the world, so to speak. And so when, uh, even though we have a, a climate that's similar to South, South America, and so we should be leaning towards them and seeing what they're doing and turning the economies around, allowing biotech um, techniques, we, 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 we're not able to, well, we've, we've, we're, we're, we're basically crawling to that because Europe has taken a different stance and it has a ripple effect. So the world is a global village, but 10 years from now, I'd like to see a, um, a world where we have um, a, a crop that children can eat and not suffer from blindness or have, have um, uh, uh, eat maybe uh, sweet potatoes, you know, that can help with some, some nutrition problems. We have so many issues with stunting. There's so many things that CRISPR and all the, 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 the rest of the, the technologies can help with. Thank you. Uh, and Tom, you're a more critical voice on, on, on new, those new, new editing uh, techniques. How do you see the future? Well, I think, uh, I feel I'm in a bit of a time warp that 20 years ago, the same promises were being made for GM. Um, and the idea that uh, we just got the, 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 wrong, the wrong GM came out first. Actually, 20 years ago, Golden Rice was just a couple of years from uh, stopping blindness in hundreds of thousands of children. And I think one of the issues is here, we're in, uh, uh, I mean, it's the anniversary, actually, of George Orwell's 1984 coming out. And there's a lovely phrase in George Orwell's 1984, which is the definition of power is being able to tear human minds apart and put them together in shapes of your choosing. So I think the last 20 years and potentially the next 20 years will be an ongoing process of trying to take away very clear facts like the 300,000 farmers under official figures who have committed suicide in India, that not all of them can be put down to, ah, oh, that was BT cotton, uh, that was a particular genetically modified organism, but it's widely acknowledged. I mean, go into the academic literature, the link between the combination of neoliberalism, increased use of pesticides, and the complete failure of BT cotton to do other than intensify the treadmill layer on. So, um, I think, you know, the comparison with the motor car, uh, does anybody remember Volkswagen and particulate pollution? And in your country, and certainly in Britain, 64,000 deaths a year attributed to, to car pollution that came out of the corporate malpractice that, you know, as somebody said this morning, no human, no sector of human society is immune from this. So we clearly need good regulation. That's what the, the group I work with, ETC, and my 20-year academic career working in India and elsewhere would say. We need actual technology assessment and without that I think gene editing will repeat the problems of the past and uh, uh, I mean we are actually in a context here where the climate change people have mentioned climate change I mean it's 50 50 whether climate change has already gone over the tipping point and we're in irreversible cataclysmic climate change the other 50 percent is that it's just really really bad so in that context I think, you know, no wonder a thousand people uh, chose to get arrested in London uh, a couple of months ago, uh, because these, these are potentially cataclysmic times. So gene editing to me is a bit of a, you know, meh. Yeah. And, 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 and if you look like uh, your ideal picture of, uh, for instance, uh, agriculture in Sub-Saharan Africa, what would, look, what would it look like if you say, well, this is not the way to go? What? Well, I, I, I'm afraid I disagree with patients' view that, oh, there's no time for organic agriculture. I mean, actually, I won't speak for Africa, uh, but India has the most number of malnourished people in the, the world. In fact, the majority of malnourished people in the world live in India, and actually in smallholder farms that feed over the, half the world's population, if you look at all smallholder farms, um, practicing maybe not you know, perfect certified European gold-plated organic agriculture, but largely subsistence and uh, low-input agriculture are, are feeding billions of people. So, so I think, you know, there's, there's organic low-input agriculture and, and biotech comes in with a corporate push for, for profit. Now, I'm not saying uh, against technology. I mean, to give personal anecdotes, given that we're on those, my daughter, who's now 13, is only alive because uh, she had a chemical 
uh, that put surfactant in her lungs when she was just born, so she was in intensive care. Now, the reason that happened is that her mother, my partner, had a disease that they're now finding is linked to the remnants of industrial mining in the north of England. So, you know, I could tell that as a good story about the pharmaceutical industry, or I can say, actually, we didn't see what we were doing, we didn't take a precautionary approach, and we didn't regulate the, uh, the uh, heavy industry of northern England in uh, 100 years ago. So, and, and Johan, for you, like, um, you, you work in animal breeding, and like, yep. there, there were hardly any GMO animals. Is, is CRISPR going to change this? Well, let's start the, the big picture, sure. which is uh, the, the big challenge that we have. How do we feed the world, which is a big challenge now, and which will be an even bigger challenge in 10 years from now. And, and animal proteins will play a role in that. And not by uh, consuming grains that we as humans can uh, consume directly. By, by, by consuming and converting those materials, which we cannot directly eat into valuable proteins. And, but we need to do it better, uh, more sustainable. And for that, we need all the tools that there are. Uh, and breeding is just one of the tools. And within breeding, yes, there, there is there is role for gene editing. And I would view it in particular there where we actually don't have the tools now. Uh, the, the classical breeding as we have it has is, is, brought us a lot of good things. But also, maybe, uh, but, but we can't use it in, in all cases. So I see gene editing in particular fitting in in those areas where we currently lack the tools to make the changes. And like in the polls, those areas are related to animal welfare, and, and many of them linked to the fact that we need to get away with interventions like dehorning, uh, castration, and so on, which are really welfare issues. Um, management practices which we currently have. And the other one is uh, reducing antibiotics, which, is, uh, which really needs to happen. So uh, if we can make animals more disease resistant, it could help. But uh, again, uh, gene editing is going to be one of the tools. But if there's no biosecurity in place, then please don't jump to gene editing as the solution. So if I hear the African swine fever crisis in China, oh, that can be solved by gene editing, then I would say it will take you 10 years before you have the pigs. But if the biosecurity situation is as bad as it is currently, it's not going to help. So it needs to, it, it will help, but it's not a silver bullet. And uh, it will take at least 10 years. And, and Niels, you're working for like, a, you have a lot of breeders under you, <laughs> to say so, you, you, you rep represent a lot of, a lot of breeders. Like, do all those breeders uh, think the same? Do they all think CRISPR is, is, is good? or is, is, is every, every breeding company has its own strategic directions, has its own choices, so it's an enormous diversity in how they see the future. Um, but when you ask me, uh, not necessarily starting with the global f food security, etc. But when we see farmers here in Europe, in the Netherlands, um, they are under tremendous pressure. Societal demands on farmers uh, are increasing at a very uh, quick pace. And plant breeding has always contributed tremendously to improving the farming systems all over the world, but let's concentrate here now. And the question is not now, um, so plant breeding is very powerful, but it's also very slow. And I see the um, effect of the discussion here. Uh, if plant breeding is to contribute to the next level of farming systems, initially in Europe, uh, then uh, speeding up the plant breeding process is very important and CRISPR can or gene editing, all the different techniques can indeed help there. Um, so basically, looking at 20 years from now, uh, has uh, society uh, accepted, embraced uh, technology, then plant breeding will have contributed more to solving the societal problems. If society has not, then the improvements have to come from other directions, which are at least as complex as plant breeding. One little thing about Africa where I have 
lived for quite some time as well. Um, when we talked 20 years ago, we were all pretty confident that the local farming systems were very well adapted to the very specific local conditions. When I come mainly in East Africa then, climate is changing so quickly that the local farming systems and the local varieties don't work anymore. So plant breeding has a tremendous role to play in making uh, farming still possible. That doesn't depend on CRISPR-Cas just like that because um, we still don't have the delivery systems even for sharing seeds with farmers and working for all these different types of farmers and different farming systems. But defi definitely the toolbox of the plant breeder is an important prerequisite for meeting those challenges as well. And the last one, Leon. You probably, I would also say that like the way uh, society is going to embrace will uh, yeah, will define if those products will be in the supermarket or not. You're from the, you're, you're looking at it probably from the retail yeah. side. Yeah, well, we've just had to talk about chickens, and I think it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg story here, to be honest, because we actually we sell products, and those products, uh, well, if you if you look at the way our customers, and we have not one customer, we have quite a few millions. Uh, the way they look at it is, in general, it needs to be tasteful, it needs to be healthy, it needs to be safe and affordable. That's our materiality analysis, and then there is nothing for a while, and then come ethical behavior and ethics, and then we got sustainability. And at the same time, we don't see the possibility for any copy-paste. I mean, when we compare also the neighboring countries, the Netherlands and Belgium, people are looking differently at products. And actually we have a nice voting system in our supermarkets because our customers vote every time they come <laughs> because they buy it or don't buy it. And whether they buy it or not is based on whether they trust the product. They have good experience and they trust the product. And that's what it's all about. So whether the technology behind is CRISPR or is any other technology or way of production because it's, as the other speakers here, or panelists say, it's not a one thing, it's, it's the whole package of things together. I mean, we are confronted with uh, groups that approach us and say, well, your, your footprint is too high. CRISPR can answer that. Yes, but your pesticide use of your farmers is, because they are very bad guys, of course, it's too high. CRISPR can answer that. And then at the same time, we would be asked to, to have a judgment about technology, and we cannot do that, because we do not know what we judge. So we, we need to look at products, we can, and that's what we are doing actually, we, we play a role in, in, in transferring a message to the market, but at the other side, we need still to offer a product that is appreciated by the market and that they trust. And then it makes a lot of difference whether you go to Indonesia, we got 160 stores in the Jakarta area in Indonesia. If I go there and I talk about uh, animal welfare, they have quite a different perception of animal welfare because they want to eat every day. And they have also a different perception of food safety because they cook their chicken for an hour, at least I think, if I eat it there. So it is clean, all the bacteria are gone. Yes, so, there is no copy-paste, there is no one-size-fits-all, but we, we certainly need to be sure that we, 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 we tell the customer what they buy. We've got to be honest about it. We've got to be ready to tell the story. But it never will be our story, it will be somebody else's story, and many stories coming from people like you're sitting in the audience here. And, and are there any, any, any boundaries to what you put in the supermarket? Are there some products which you, which you say, well, it might be okay, but uh, like the, uh, maybe the government says it's okay, but then again, is this one step too far? Or is this well, we, 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 we do that uh, maybe based on ethical, for ethical reasons. I mean, uh, when it's, it's, it's uh, bond from, from animals or whether it's hairs or whether it's... Uh, we, have, we have baseline criteria, but in general, uh, we are very careful <coughs> to be in the, put ourselves in the position of the government or scientists, because simply we don't know. With 200,000 own brand products worldwide, 
we cannot be an expert. So we need to rely on, on others. And, and do we already know a little bit how the Dutch or Belgian public uh, looks at CRISPR? Or no, we don't. No, not because all. actually you can ask them an opinion, but what are you asking them? Yeah. There are no products yet. Because you need to give them an added value at that moment in time. They need to know what it is in relation to their product. So I don't see also an, an, a role for us to promote the technology as such. We can play a role in introduction. And we can play a role in, in, in maybe uh, explaining or transferring a message or making sure that there is a complete story. But it needs to be balanced, always. But, but you, you asked the question, do, uh, people, do your, the consumers know what CRISPR is? Did you, did you ever ask them, do you know what, what plant or animal breeding is? And, and I would, because I would be not surprised if people say, animal breeding, that is, uh, that is the same as animal production. So we, we talk about a, a, a very important and promising technology, let's be clear. But I think we need to put it into the broad perspective because uh, when it's about animals, then uh, it, that's quite a different debate than about plants. So uh, oh yeah, we, we breed animals. We already do have uh, guidelines uh, on, on how, how to do that because uh, yes, working with animals comes with responsibility. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, genetic diversity is maintained. We need to make sure that the animals are, are not suffering. So that's why there is a guideline set up and that the, uh, the Council for Animal Affairs has also set up some kind of how to judge animal breeding. And I would say we can use exactly that same framework also for, for genetic, which is a, a tool. It's one of the tools that animal breeding is using, but we focus a lot on CRISPR, while, yeah, that's only one of the, that's, that's one toolbox, but the, the, the uh, the first question is, do we allow the, uh, the person to come in which has that tool, which the person is then the breeder? So I think we, there's a risk that with focusing on this new technology, if people do not have an understanding of what breeding is, whether that's plant, animal, or any other organism, then how can they have an opinion on uh, what CRISPR is? Well, what should we do then? If they, they well, we, so it's so that's why uh, I've heard a lot uh, communicating educators says let's, uh, let's let's start discussing and, and hearing about what people what they know so that we make sure that we we start the discussion at the same yeah. wavelengths. Yeah. I mean, for me, this discussion is going in a slightly worrying way because when GM came along, we were in that post-Cold War era of, like, let's redefine what capitalism is, what citizenship is, and I felt, maybe I was young and naive, that there was some compact between science and society where there'd be democratic regulation, there'd be better dialogue between science and society. And I just noticed a trend of, oh, but they don't know anything anyway, and no. so let's just carry on. And I think the, the worry is, in, in Africa, for example, what we do know is going on is ethical dumping. So this is researchers going in, whether it be pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies, going in and saying, well, it'll be, it'll be good for somebody somewhere else, so we're going to go and try things out in Africa. So this is very well documented. There's now a European declaration to stop ethical dumping. Um, that Doris Schroeder at the University of Bonn and Central Lancashire has pioneered. And, and the thing is, if you don't get free prior informed consent from people on the ground, I mean, it's not, we're not even talking about them uh, having, I don't know, citizens' assemblies and going through a more rigorous process, but people need to understand what's being trialled on them, which, you know, it, it, it may not be ph pharmaceutical products, it may actually be gene-edited mosquitoes uh, that are supposedly going to cure malaria, but actually, if they're using gene drives, which it's interesting, nobody barely mentioned today, uh, uh, could actually lead to the wiping out of whole cropping systems if the gene drives don't do what they're meant to. So, you know, I think the, we need technology democracy. That's one of my lifetime passions and one of ETC's things. And how we do it is a, an interesting question, but maybe we'll come on to that. And yes, I, 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 yeah, I, I see you like Yes. <laughs> you want I, to write, I, yes, really. uh, yes, I want to jump in. <laughs> yeah. Yes, so, you know, one of the things that I advocate for is to let Africa speak for herself. So, <laughs> so, 
so, so when you say ethical dumping, Africa has guidelines. You can't come into Africa and try anything on anyone without procedures. So for instance, when we talk about the big companies in quote, I think that basically what we have in Africa, just like here, if you walk into a supermarket and you ask people, I've watched a video, what is GMO? They tell you, I don't eat GMO, I don't touch it, and then they went on to ask, and this video was done in America. And they didn't know what GMO was. But they've listened to the propaganda that's out there that's told them that GMO and so on is bad. So I went back to Africa, and I asked my friends, and uh, those of them who are on social media have read and seen all kinds of things, and they all told me GMO is bad, and I asked, what's GMO? And they have no idea. So Africa, when you talk about ethical dumping, I think what is happening more that I have experienced is that there's a, um, uh, like, more like an opinion dumping on Africa. <laughs> so you are sending your views to people and making them think a certain way, and that's not it. We have a mind, we can think, there are people who are checking things, and so we can actually be able to come out with a decision on our own. What is good for Africa? What do we need? What can help us? And be able to take a decision. I think that even with whatever, if we, if we even talk about organic farming, for instance, or, or, or I mean, in relation to GMO, I'm a farmer. And I know that the difference is not in the seed. It's in the procedure that you use to grow your seed. So if I use organic fertilizers, uh, insect, uh, I mean, uh, uh, non-chemical non uh, insecticides or pesticides, mm -hmm. those are the requirements for organic um, um, farming. So when we say an organic farmer doesn't want to listen to the benefits of technology or biotech, you really then don't fully understand it because it's the seed that you use. So if, if the seed is modified in GMO and I don't have to spray, BT cotton, Africa had a huge textile industry that died. In Nigeria, I'm wearing a dress that's African print, but the cotton was imported from India. So we had a cotton industry that died because boar worms ate all the, all, all the, the cotton. <coughs> so with BT cotton, which we, we only recently got approvals for, the farmers spray less. The issues are more are beyond someone telling us this is good. We have seen and, and when you raise the issue of India, for instance, of, of suicide, we know that people kill themselves for different reasons, and, and that issue still is debatable. The issue with Burkina, with GM... In, so you in, speak in, for in, India as well now? No, I'm not speaking for India. <laughs> I'm, just like saying, I'm just saying that we, we need to always have the people speak for themselves. The issue with Burkina, I'm, I'm from Africa, and when the GM uh, issue came in Burkina, and it was that it was... We, when we went and we spoke with people from Burkina, it was a different response we got. So it's very important for us so that we don't get the issues. The conversation needs to keep going. But if we get the wrong idea out there, then the conversation gets distorted. And then the people who are policy makers get afraid to allow new things. Scientists have a lot of things on the shelves in the labs. And in the words of Norman Borlaug, he said, take it to the farmer. But how does it go to the farmer? It can only go to the farmer if policy can allow it to come. If the industry, I have been, if when you talk about the, the big fives, in a country like Nigeria, for instance, the big five Monsanto is not willing to take BT cotton, uh, uh, corn to Nigeria. Because of, and I have been talking directly to all the people, I was growing hybrid corn for Monsanto in Nigeria for several years, and Monsanto will not bring GM corn to Nigeria because of public opinion. So when we make it look like there's a conspiracy that really wants to hold people down, I buy hybrid corn every year, and I don't buy it from Monsanto, I buy it from another seed company. So am I enslaved to that seed company? No, I make a choice. So I think it's about people being able to choose. There was one interesting thing also, like um, there's, <laughs> there seems to be in, uh, in, in Europe, and then Tom was also mentioning a little bit of a consensus that the first, uh, the, the first GMO project we put on the market was this uh, herbicide tolerant uh, soy. 
and it wasn't a good idea. But you it was were actually tomato was the first. Yeah, the, the flavor saver was, was also failed. That's true. <laughs> problematic. That's true. Yeah, but uh, like the first big one was this uh, herbicide tolerance, and everybody said, "Well, we're not big, uh, not that much of a fan of herbicide tolerance anymore." But you would say, "Well, yes, you still, so we still embrace this." Oh yes, because you know um, the thing is this: when when we l I, I I took time out really begin to look at what GMO is, and I looked at scientific research with every other thing. That if I, I mean, there's a million and one things that cause cancer, but we haven't stopped taking them, have we? But when I looked at GMO, there is no scientific research, and that should be the basis for saying this is wrong. Now, when we use, um, uh, if we had tolerant, um, I mean, uh, 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 corn that I could grow, uh, spray glyphosate on. Look at the fact that smallholder farmers in Asia and Africa are weeding by hand. So the reason why they grow only small fields is that they would grow only the fields that they can work by hand, and that is it. So if I can cover a quarter of a hectare, that's what I'll grow. If I can cover half, that's what I'll grow. So if you have... Uh, um, uh, some, I mean, um, uh, uh, herbicide tolerant crop. They could grow larger fields because then it would come back to them spraying. They are already using herbicides, but then this gives them the option to be able to grow more food. So y y you have to look at the fact that these things have a way of, of, of coming back to have benefit. What we basically should be looking at is, is it safe? How do you regulate it from misuse? If those things are in place, and this is a technology that will serve the greater good, then the conversation should be, how do we get it to the people that need it? And how do we get them to embrace it? I'm a farmer, and all the farmers around me, I don't know how it works with farmers here, but I'm a member of the GFN, and I talk to farmers all over the world. Farmers do what works. If you grow a seed, if they ask you what was the yield, you say it was high, they will buy that seed next to you. So it's the same thing, I, and, and I think that this is a consideration that we should look at, that is it safe to use it? If it is, then is it regulated enough to prevent misuse? And not a lot of lengthy conversations about a lot of things that would only prolong the process. Do you want to react here? Yes, please. I think this is a really interesting discussion, but this is CRISPR-Con. Why are we talking about GMOs? Is it only because a judge interpreted text here in Europe <coughs> that uh, CRISPR products will be regulated GMOs? The same judge also said <coughs> most of the f food that we eat are actually GMOs because every product coming from uh, mutation breeding, that's what the same judge said, is GMOs. So let's please talk about a set of technologies that fit into a whole process of the last 50, 100 years where we try to make plant breeding more efficient and more effective. Um, and that is basically a next step in a logical sequence that started 80 years ago. GM, the old GM, was indeed a break in that development, because we created plants that would not be created in nature or by conventional breeding. Most CRISPR products are the same as what we could produce with conventional breeding. It would only take 20 or 50 years longer. So this, I think, I like the discussion about GMOs, but I think here, we are talking about a different issue. Yeah, so we're, we're for you, you would say like uh, CRISPR is uh, yeah should be regulated like, just like uh, mutagenesis, uh, but this is not what the UE court says. No, no. No. So the, UE, the, the <coughs> European court, but that is a legal decision. It was not a policy decision. You heard the, the policymaker uh, who had a different opinion, mm -hmm. but that's just a legal analysis. So it's a linguistic thing. So it's now up to the policymakers to determine whether they agree with this lingu linguistic interpretation of a text that is more than 30 years old. Yeah, well but, te were. but technically, I'm pretty sure, well, th there are many scientists here, I consider CRISPR uh, 
seriously different from uh, uh, transformation, transferring uh, uh, genes from one species to the other. Maybe Joe, you're a little bit more critical to this position. Uh, well, in, uh, in, in animals, uh, GMO uh, is of no use when it comes to food production. So that's, that's easy. Mutagenesis in animals would, be in a, would not be in the same category as plants. So I think we, because uh, I, I think if we would, I would, we would ask permission to get, we, we will go do mutagenesis on animals. Yeah. Then that would we would be say, a whoa. Uh, so that would be But in plants, as well. that's, that's a very common, so, common and, thing. And, and I would say, if, if I would need to explain to my neighbor, well, we're doing gene editing, and oh, that's genetic modification. And mm -hmm. so if I go away from that legal, eh, so yeah. th then I said, then I, I, it wouldn't pass the, the, the neighbor test. So but for, when for I me, CRISPR the is neighbor uh, the neighbor <laughs> test. So it's, it's, uh, it, I think it's, uh, yeah, we, we modify the, the genome. So I guess within the whole category, because now it's CRISPR, maybe in, in four years, I, I talked to Jean Renaud, yeah. said, no, maybe not, but then we come up with another system. Of course. So in the whole set of tools that we have to edit the, the genome to change, uh, genetic modification, the old one was a hit and run. Now we have a more precise, but I would say, let's call it uh, genetic modification. But what but about, what about using dihaploids, which in many crops we are using, embryo rescue? There's so many laboratory techniques that we have been using for decades in plant breeding. Maybe less, well, artificial yeah. insemination, quite technical. Yeah, I know, I, and, and, and they, they are all subject, no, lay, lay, lay they all okay. subject to discussion. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, what we are seeing here is that we are trying to answer questions that are not asked. I mean, not you, you've got to give an answer to the question that was asked to you in the market. And if they have a concern about gene editing, you cannot answer it by a story, <laughs> if they answer I have a question in Africa about gene editing. You cannot answer from the European perspective. We are seeing that every day, we, most of our business is in the US, where we have quite a few examples of uh, uh, engineered crops. And also there, you have the examples where, well, the most obvious one was, I think, salmon a couple of years ago, engineered salmon, which was just released to the market. And then you see also in the market as US that if you don't give that the proper backup, it just fails immediately because you can come with a very come up with a very credible story about all the tests and all the justifications and everything, but the customer has concerns. You got to answer that, but there's concerns in their area on with their background. But does that also influence, like, uh, for instance, you have now the UE court decision that it might like uh, get get into the stringent regulation of GMO CRISPR? Does it? Does it? Does the way of regulating in the, somehow also like influence the way people think about it? Or? Well, my, 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 my per personal perception is that these kind of decisions are taken on a technical ground because the, the, the perception discussions, the emotional discussions uh, have, not been ta have not taken place sufficiently. And I think from that perspective, Europe might be ahead of the other countries because they need to have that debate later. Uh, but it goes terribly slow here, and we try to answer questions for others. Uh, but at the end, it's about added value on the product that you offer to the market. Yeah. And, and Tom, you, you were actually also like uh, lobbying, let's say, for, for a whole different way of like getting those products, like this participatory. Well, yeah, I mean, plant breeding is is fantastic, and there's a whole model which I probably many members of the uh, people in the room are aware of, of participatory plant breeding, which has a really strong tradition throughout uh, the world. Uh, I mean, in Britain, we kind of destroyed our extension system, but now it's coming back through agroecology movements. And there, it's sort of farmer to farmer learning, and often scientists coming in. Um, uh, Michel Pambert, who uh, set up the Center for Agroecology, made his name in uh, through ICRASAT, the UN agency, doing participatory plant, plant breeding. But I think the reason we're having to talk about GM, I don't want to talk about GM, is that if we don't learn the mistakes from history, we're condemned to repeat them, as some wise person said, and uh, the, the problem is at the moment I feel uh, people are speaking with an authority about what gene editing will do, 
And it's just, it's, it's, I mean, talk about, you know, when I started this, I've got a, a degree in ecology and a PhD in genetics. And I have to say, in the late 90s, it was like, to some of the environmental NGOs, it's like, look, guys, hold back a bit. You may be going a bit beyond the evidence here. And, and you know, don't annoy my scientists who I work with. Now it's the flip side. The environmental NGO NGOs is, uh, is sort of like holding back and the scientists are going, CRISPR, it's just amazing, it's going to solve everything. And, uh, you know, climate change, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's weird, it's a weird world we're working in at the moment. Thanks. Uh, a little bit back to the question also of this panel. How, how are we going to get uh, those CRISPR products to the people who need it the most? And one thing... <laughs> Uh, which you hear often also from scientists say, well, CRISPR is different because it's easy, it's fast, it's cheap. Uh, it makes it different than, than GMO. But you were also saying that at the moment also there, the licensing to do it is, is already quite expensive or not? You well, the well, I don't know details there, but what is really important is that in my constituency, those breeding companies, uh, different companies look at the technology. And at the moment, particularly, the small ornamental breeding, breeding companies, they are really looking out what can we do with this technology because of the pressure of uh, limiting uh, chemical um, uh, crop protection. So there's a lot of demand for more resistant varieties and also flower breeding is very, uh, very slow. So they really come up and say, what can we do with this? And yes, there are the technology is, of course, not as complex as a genetic modification, uh, but of course you need a lot of knowledge. And by now there are some service providers, of course universities do work, but also co commercial service providers. They go and sit with these ornamental breeders. You might do this, you might do that, you need that, you need that, and you need a license. And uh, there is then indeed a complexity uh, can those licenses be granted at, uh, in a way that all those 350 members of my association yeah. can not only technically use it, but can also commercially use it. And there is still a question how that is going to work. Yeah, so because it might be too expensive or some? Or yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's what I hear back. Yeah, also yeah. from academia, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Is this something you recognize already? Offer it? I would say, like, often people say, well, African university can now, like, CRISPR their own crops, uh, yam, and... Uh. Yeah. yeah, so I was saying to you earlier on, but before that, I just wanted to say that there was something that just went on here that I think happened with GMO. Yeah. And if, if it, I mean, you're a scientist. And the truth <coughs> is, I'm speaking only to the application of the science. And when you, you bring the science and the technicalities of whether it's GMO or CRISPR or it's, G, <coughs> it's modified or it's... If the scientists, the scientists have to find a way to effectively communicate the science. So when I come to it, I just want the application of the science explained to me in a way that I can understand it. So when you, when you, you can't do that, then you lose it again like we lost, with, I mean like GMO. So it's the communication of the science, the application of it to people to understand. Please so don't speak for me. I didn't lose GMO. <laughs> I'm quite happy to have no GMOs grown in Europe. Just saying. You no, know, I mean, I understand your point. I mean, I'm just saying that generally that, that it's important that with any technology, I mean, uh, CRISPR is a tool. GMO is a tool. We, we, we promote all kinds of technology. Soil, um, we're, we're trying to do no-till. There's a lot of things that we, we would put holistically to solve the problems of the world. One thing won't solve it, but if it can help, then let's not make it difficult for it to be able to, to help. But would licensing be a problem then? Yes, yeah, so, so what we, we also have in, in Nigeria is we have universities that have research um, uh, centers that are licensed to produce seeds. So um, there's a, we recently got BT uh, Cowpea released in Nigeria. So what that did was there was an organization called AATF that works with that and so on. So I think that a way to go for CRISPR would be to get it to possibly go through a public bread variety uh, uh, kind of setting. That in Africa, that would work. Because then the university would be able to, to work on it, to breed it, and to sell it. Yeah. Um, I don't know how long do I still have? Ten minutes. 10 minutes. 
Okay, because I also wanted to, to, to as, as a last team before we go to the question, is this communication? Like often people say, well, maybe we did made some mistake, mistakes in transparency and so. And you're working on this uh, castration-free pigs. Yes. How how does it work? How do you like get the public to know what you're doing? Now, so we started off with uh, making a position statement and said we don't need it. Uh, we CRISPR is a... An well, maybe first, uh, why do we... Uh, castration-free pick, why do we need it? Yeah. Why is it hard to get there? But before that, we said it's a, it's a promising technique, so that's why we will follow it uh, actively, but we don't need it to increase production, so we're not a fan of uh, the, 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 cell, the, gene, the gene-edited salmon uh, doesn't fit into that story. But when it comes to... So uh, the most promise was in welfare trades, and then we, we joined with another company and uh, Recombinetics in the US to form an alliance to stop castration of male pigs, and that is done because otherwise meat coming from those pigs would have an off flavor. And that's, so that's a clear welfare <coughs> which, uh, which we need to resolve. So when we, we talked about, uh, yeah, that could have been more tamed. Uh, when we talk about sustainable animal production, then uh, we want to get rid of uh, uh, surgical castration. And in that case, uh, gene editing would offer uh, yep. a solution. And we have published that we are going to do this. We have <coughs> recently published that the first uh, piglets are on the ground. And what are the next steps in the research? So we now we're going to investigate whether, A, knocking out the gene has the effect on the animals not having the taste. But we will also investigate <coughs> the other things. And we've also yeah, published what is the next step in doing this. So we're being very open in the steps that we follow and we consciously publish it now because it's the product is it's it's a long way from it being on the market so that we also can get the discussion going on whether this solution to this problem would be an acceptable one yeah. or not. And that's important for us to know before we would uh, start using this uh, in commercially. And but do you already know how people react, or is it is it or not a list? No. So we we are uh, involved in a research to actually investigate that. So, but that's uh, ongoing research. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Too early well, to, uh, to probably the last a couple of minutes, maybe some questions. I, I like the first one also, maybe because we were all, the discussion is also always of what are the risks if we do it. But are there also risks and ethics of not using technique? Maybe Tom Canada. Um, I think. I would trust a process of people like are on this panel, but also citizens who could learn about that question. And in this process that has been around, I think Netherlands was one of the countries that pioneered a participatory technology assessment. So I think uh, you know there's an awful lot of hand waving going on. Uh, I don't think we're at a place where people um, can put numbers on the answer to that question, but I think what is the advantage of these citizens' assemblies, which are now had great success in places like Ireland on uh, winning, women, winning women the right to abortion through a, a, a really um, rigorously organized process, that we can do that for, um, I mean, actually, the, the future of, uh, given the panel we're on, the future of farming, of which gene editing could be part of the discussion, but so would runaway climate change, so would, well, is, do people actually want to work on the land? Because I think one of the trends that we're missing here is that there's this assumption, which, you know, I spent a lot of the last 20 years in, in, in visiting India, um, there is an assumption, and it's a real becomes a reality if you let it go into your system that, oh, nobody wants to work on the land. Whereas in Europe, there's a strong counter trend among some, I'm not saying it's universal. Now, are we just going to assume that none of us ever wants to touch a plant again and we just want to open a, a plastic wrapper and eat it and that could be a debate that could be had with citizens a couple of hundred citizens um, and the commission's funded things like this before and uh, so uh, given that I live in Britain maybe as my parting gift to uh, uh, to you is not Nigel Farage but participatory <laughs> technology <laughs> so. uh, and Niels has also a question maybe from you because you said how can we afford that CRISPR is de facto monopolized by one company and you were telling me also about the there might be multiple CRISPR systems. Well, that definitely, but that's a technical uh, thing. Yeah. By the way, <laughs> thanks for switching it off for a while. Um, uh, we at Plantum, we have initiated uh, some over 10 years ago a big discussions about patenting in plant breeding. And um, in the end, um, 
Europe is deciding not to grant any patents on, call it native trades, natural trades anymore. Um, I, it would be really good if we can avoid a next debate about patenting, uh, meaning that um, uh, maybe there are ways by the industry itself to avoid uh, monopolization uh, like. through, through the IP systems. Oh, yeah. And I think that would be really useful. But that's my personal thing. Maybe not all my 350 members agree in the same way, but I think quite a number of them. We have made clear in the case, uh, because we are also a, a big company that is referred <laughs> to it. When we talked about the uh, castration-free case, that uh, we will make it available to all companies. So that's, uh, well, and, but, but don't ask me whether that's at the same price as those that have been involved in the alliance. The answer to that is obviously not. But we will make it available because it's, uh, he said, the, why, we start, why we did this is to say we will try to solve an animal welfare issue. And then I don't want to stand here and say, well, I've got the animal welfare issue resolved, but you cannot use it. That's a, <laughs> and, that's and, a very and difficult... And that's uh, what I'm, I'm saying, that we can go into a new legislative move, etc. Yeah. If we can avoid it, it would be good. Yeah. Well, maybe the last one, because I see the top uh, question is now, do you have a role in the education, the educating the consumers, uh, Leo? <coughs> yeah, I think we, we definitely have a role about educating cross, uh, customers, but I'm not so sure if we should educate customers about technology. We have a role in, uh, well, explaining that the, the, that the products that we offer are re produced in a responsible way, in a credible way, that they are safe, and that they are healthy. And the, the, the whole discussion around, around technology, I don't think our customers are primarily interested, to be honest. So nobody boycotted GM in the 15 there years There are ago? always groups, people, I don't know whether it's customers, to be honest, that have their objections. And we need to answer those questions, uh, of course. I mean, as I said, you need to answer the questions that people ask you. But the primary interest of our customers is the products, and those products need to be good. And that needs to be backed up by proper science, proper governance. I mean, most of the discussions here, I think, boil down to governance around uh, gene editing. So yes, we can play a role. And if needed, we will play that role. We always will be transparent. We, we will not ignore. But, well, the story will not be about technology, probably, but about the product and the added value. Thank you. Someone, a last remark before we go to the the drinks? Well, I was just interested specifically on the supermarkets that if um, people become more aware of the environmental crisis and that actually um, agroecologically agro produced things are better, then I guess there's, I mean, we're in Varkening and here has a really thriving community-supported agriculture scheme. So to some extent, people, if you don't support uh, more agroecological approaches, people will vote with their feet and join community supported agriculture schemes. So I guess, you know, if you ignore technology, it could come back to bite you. No, but it's exactly what I said. It's, it's part of the product and the way a product is produced. And that needs to be in a credible way, not compromising the other planetary boundaries, if that's the case, uh, for example. Uh, but it's part of the package. Uh, we are not communicating a lot of technology, I have to say. Thank you. I think I'll leave it at this because Ernst <laughs> is getting onto the podium. <laughs>